Thank you. Uh, this is Peter Isikoff, chair of the Greensboro Minimum Housing Commission. Uh, we're calling this meeting to order. Uh, the first matter of business is each of the commissioners has received a draft agenda from city staff and uh, I would entertain any motions on adopting the agenda. This is Carolyn and I move that we adopt agenda as sent. I second. This is Andrew Young. I second it. Thank you. We have a motion and second. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote since it's Zoom. Um, I apologize. I was muted. Commissioner Brown? Which one? Oh, me. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Biggerstaff? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Waddell? I'm here. Uh, Commissioner Young? Yes. Chair Isakoff? Yes. Uh, did Commissioner Nazim join? Just join up. Better in. Okay. Um, Suzanne, we're, we're voting on adopting the agenda that was emailed out. Okay, sorry. And I look horrible, so no comments from the peanut gallery, please. Nope. No um, worries. Um, I'm fine with the, with the um, agenda. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So that passes unanimously. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to staff for the training presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can switch over from the agenda. There we go. Does everybody see the um, PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So, um, as we move through this presentation, there there are three parts to it. Um, I'll handle the first part. Uh, Jasmine uh, Presla will handle the middle part, which is the legal. And is Cindy Bloom here? I don't, I don't see her. If she's not here when we get to the rehab part, then I'll cover that portion as well. We estimate the training not to last more than an hour. We're getting this started a little late, but we'll try to make it some time. Roy, this is Judy. Excuse me for a moment. You're breaking up a little bit whenever you're talking. Uh, maybe you need to speak right into your computer. That will, might help. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So, Troy, would you go over the last couple of things you said? I didn't hear it either. Okay. I said we uh, um, we're going to try to keep the training to one hour uh, to respect everyone's time and uh, go through the presentation. I'll handle the first part, and legal counsel will handle the second. Uh, and if Cynthia Blue is not on here by the time we get to the rehab part, then I'll cover that um, for the remainder uh, of the training session. All right, so if you have any questions or something along the way, if you'd like to uh, maybe make a note of it uh, so that if we don't engage in too much uh, discussion through it, we might can get, get through it all and then maybe uh, talk about some things there at the end as we wrap up, if that's, if that's okay with the commissioners. Thank you. That sounds great. All right, so in the overview, what we're going to cover is the role of the Housing Commission, the Code Compliance Housing Enforcement Process, Vacant Housing Receivership Pilot Initiative, the Rehabilitation Program Eligibility and Timelines, the Quasi-Judicial Standards and Code of Conduct, and then any questions and answers at the end. So the role of the Housing Commission. The purpose of the commission is listed in the handbook for boards and commissions that is adopted by the city council. So it says to study the rental rates, 
the need to, for reconditioning and condemnation and other housing conditions within the city. Debt decides on matters appealed from rules of the building inspector, which these are your code inspectors and the chief building inspector and the fire inspector concerning the housing code and inspects houses and living quarters in the city, having the right to enter with the building inspector for that purpose. In addition, the new late for receivership, this is an additional duty that's not yet been added to the handbook, but has been adopted by council. And that is to file petitions with the Guilford County Superior Court in compliance with this statute in 160A 439.1, vacant building receivership to utilize the services of the city attorney or employ independent attorneys or law firms to file such petitions as selected by the city attorney. And we'll talk about this later. There's a slide on receivership, but this is an additional duty that has been delegated from the council's powers to the commission. Decisions of the commission are subject to review by Superior Court of Guilford County by proceeding in the nature of certiorari instituted within 15 days of the decision by the commission. So what that means is any decision that the commission makes, if a person still, a, a person that has standing, if they still feel aggrieved by the decision, then their appeal goes to Superior Court. The housing enforcement process. For inspections and violations, the current uh, edition of the International Property Maintenance Code is the 2018 edition. Uh, the city ordinance for the minimum housing code adopts automatically the current edition of the IPMC. This code is updated every three years. So we expect another uh, update in 2021 um, and it will require no additional adoption. That's the way the ordinance is written. So once the IPMC year comes out, that will be the new edition that we will have to enforce uh, as the minimum code. Inspections are conducted on the interior and exterior of the building. The inspector does a complete assessment beginning on the outside and then on the inside to have a conversation with the owner about any deficiencies that they find. There's two types of violations. You have major violations and you have minor. The difference between the two is the major violations are your life, health and safety violations uh, in which can harm an occupant or threaten the health of an occupant. You may be um, the structure's integrity from a storm, um, the uh, no power, no potable water, unsafe electrical wiring, um, fuse boxes being overloaded by the power, anything that can that can cause that can risk fire. Those are those are what you're looking at for your major violations. It is or the determination of the inspector to articulate uh, that major condition. All other violations of the housing code are deemed to be minor. When, they, when the inspector looks at the minor, more than five violation, minor violations or one major gives them the opportunity to open an enforcement action. If they get a complaint and they, they do their investigation, if they do not have six or more uh, housing violations that are minor, they're not permitted to open a housing case. Instead, what we do is we counsel with the owner and help educate them on the deficiencies found um, and provide them with any resources available such as the rehab program. Um, however, we, cannot, we do not have the authority to take an enforcement action by a city ordinance. A major violation, if it is a residential structure, then the inspector would go ahead and take an action um, for a 48 hour notice uh, to correct the violation or for the occupant to, to remove themselves from the structure uh, that protects their safety. If it is a non-residential structure, all major violations are directed to the chief building inspector uh, as directed in the good repair ordinance. The good repair ordinance adopted this past year by the city council is the non-residential code 
for the minimum standard uh, of maintenance. And when you do look in the in Chapter 11's housing code, the good repair ordinance adopts all codes in the IPMC as its minimum standard for non-residential structures, except those codes that are specifically listed in 11-57. So when you when you assess when the inspectors assess a non-residential building, like a commercial building or a building that does not contain a dwelling, or if it's a multi-use building, a floor that does not, a level that does not contain a dwelling, then you would assess the non-residential parts of the IPMC and then go check the code sections of 11-57 and subtract them. Uh, we do not have the authority to enforce any uh, section of the IPMC code on a non-residential building that is listed in 11-57. The standards are adopted by city council. So how a case begins, the way they're reported to us is through the website. A person can submit, uh, give their name and email address. We receive- What do you need for that? Huh? Our staff receives a form and that PDF form is attached to the uh, case document. The call center is able to enter complaints that our st uh, admin staff uh, create cases from. You also have direct reporting. Anyone can call the 373-2111 line. Anyone can approach an inspector in the field uh, or in, in, the, in the office if it's a direct referral and refer a complaint to us and the, the uh, inspector can enter it or the inspector can send it to the administrative staff. Um, we also receive public agency referrals and public officer referrals. Uh, these come from the fire inspector, these come from police, field ops, any other department or officer charged with enforcing a city, uh, a city ordinance or city standard. Uh, majority, a lot of our referrals do come from fire and police. Um, and also you have a petition, you have an option, the petitions issued by a citizen, five citizens to inspect a housing structure. Now, if it's, a, if it's coming from a public official, it only has to be one. One city official can, can initiate uh, an inspection. Now, the petition only applies to residential complaints. A petition does not apply to the non-residential good repair ordinance. Um, so there is a form, there is a form for this um, that the citizen can, uh, uh, can submit and we have used those. If the inspector receives the petition, then they will go to the property. If they cannot get consent, they will pull an administrative inspection warrant and inspect the property for the conditions listed in the petition. So there's a note here that an inspector investigating a nuisance or a vehicle complaint on the property or next door to a property can open a housing case with obvious or unsafe conditions of the housing code. So we are complaint driven, meaning that the inspectors do not patrol around looking for violations there's enough violations reported by the public. Uh, on average, approximately 125 a week. Um, so there's, there's, enough, there's enough work to do. But if an inspector is in a community and they see blatant obvious violations next door, across the street, uh, that should be obvious to them and they have some sort of health and safety hazard to them, they are allowed to take an action and they should. Housing case management. We have split our housing cases into manageable sections, which are le which are five four levels. So a level one housing case is the initial complaint. That is the initial fact finding. Is there even a violation? Um, and the issuance of the order to repair or to demolish. So the inspector goes, investigates, meets with the homeowner, does their assessment, determines violations. And then they prepare a notice and they meet with the homeowner um, uh, in person for that hearing. And then they issue an order to repair. One of the things that we're gonna be changing 
are adding to this process is at that meeting of the issuance of the order to repair, the inspector is going to provide them with the resource pamphlets for the rehab and lead program, uh, as well as uh, an application to apply to the rehab program. We want to start doing an assessment of all property, all housing properties that are coming through co-compliance through rehab to see if they qualify. They will not need a lead evaluation if the structure was not um, built prior to 1978. Level two housing. Now, once the order to repair is issued, it moves the case into level two. So a level two housing is what we call the performance period. That time has a maximum time for the inspector of 90 days. Upon the expiration of that order to repair, which the order to repair expires after 30 days, the inspector is allowed to issue two 30-day extensions if the owner is making an effort to comply. The, uh, the inspector can make an extension if they have submitted a application to rehab. They can uh, provide an extension if the owner is making compliance or if the inspector feels that um, that an extension is necessary um, in good faith. It's, it's completely up to the inspector. They have a 90 day period to attempt to gain compliance. Once the 90 day period is over with, there's some, there's some options. And this is a newer process that we're gonna be, that we're gonna be working on. Um, the leadership uh, team is already working on this themselves because it's on the supervisor level. After 90 days, the inspector is gonna prepare the paperwork that is normally provided to the commission. Their fact sheet, their um, violation list, their cost, their cost estimate, uh, as well as their case notes. Uh, and they'll go ahead and submit a title search, uh, the title search request if they haven't already. They'll send that to the supervisor. The supervisor is gonna be evaluating the case as to whether or not um, rehab has anything active and, and, um, and if three situations exist for rehab, then we're going to hold the case because the city ordinance allows, um, extension without the director's approval for housing cases in which an application has been submitted to rehab housing cases in which rehab has approved an application and housing cases in which they have approved and they're awaiting construction. If any housing case fits any of those three categories, then the, the case uh, is not to be forwarded to the commission. Uh, it is to be held and monitored and we'll be monitoring it monthly. And one of the things that, one of the benefits that this serves is as long as the case, if the case is not yet forwarded to the housing commission, then that means the inspector has not issued a civil penalty. The inspector has not began to assess reinspection fees and the inspector has not condemned the structure. So if, if, uh, if the case is, uh, is under review for the rehab program, which we're setting deadline standard for those reviews, then uh, we will still the supervisors will hold on to those cases themselves. The third re the third um, opportunity for an extension will be the director's extension. If a case, if a property owner and a director's extension is only considered if the owner makes a written request, that's how it is listed in the ordinance. So the owner, the the inspector can reach out to the owner and say, hey. You know, you don't, you didn't get approved for the rehab program. You're close to gaining compliance, or you have really achieved a lot. Would you like to submit a director's extension? And if they do that, they will tell them to uh, write out a plan. What is your plan? Do you need 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days to achieve your plan toward compliance? That is submitted to the director. Uh, Stanley Wilson would review it, and, if, it, and if, it, if he feels and it appears that the owner can gain compliance within the time period that's being requested, 
then the director is authorized to issue an extension. He'll uh, designate what that deadline date is, and the inspector will monitor that compliance through that time period. And by the time the end date arrives, if they're in compliance, then the case will close with compliance. If they're not in compliance, but they're close, they can ask the director to reevaluate it again. Um, if they stop complying or there is no more effort to comply and they're not in the re they have not been accepted for the rehab program or they've not met the conditions to satisfy their acceptance, then the case will be prepared and uh, forwarded to Tony Jones that will place it on the agenda of the next meeting. Um, which would be the next in-person or virtual. We'll go through that process at that time. Uh, and it's then that the property will have to be condemned, uh, the civil penalty issued, and a month later, reinspection fees would begin to accrue. Now, this process here, um, I've looked at it and reviewed it, and we've put it in place from the feedback that we've gotten from uh, the commission on hearing cases um, uh, litigated and discussed. Uh, and, and we believe that this is an effort uh, or that the, what the commission uh, would prefer uh, in its feedback that try to get rehab involved early, try to get as much uh, um, uh, assistance provided to them early in the process um, and see what we can do to help them. So we're doing those with the current cases that currently sit with the commission, but this is a process going forward for with all of our new cases that we're gonna to begin to process. So once a case is referred to the housing commission, it becomes a level three housing case. Um, in the level three cases, all cases with the commission are accruing civil penalties, they accrue a reinspection fee. The reinspection fee is a safety inspection for the public of the structure. It's not an inspection merely that the homeowner called the inspector to the property for advice or assistance. And it's not an inspection that the inspector is preparing for a hearing of the housing commission. Reinspection fees cannot be applied for those last two scenarios the safety inspection must be on a different day. Uh, and what the safety inspection includes is the inspector has checked the structure to be sure that it is secure. Windows and doors, that it is vacant, that no one is living in it or habitating it, that is also posted condemnation warning at the front door and the rear door of the structure. All three are required by the ordinance. So the inspectors are taking a photo and they're updating a case note of that inspection. The level three requires a single inspection every 30 days. So when the inspect, and that's where your reinspection fees apply. Once referral is made to the commission, the first month of that referral is a free safety inspection. There is no reinspection fee. That's the first inspection. Even though the inspector has probably been to this property 20 times already working with the owner, only upon after condemnation does the safety inspections apply. So, and it accrues at the rate of 150 for the first, 300 for the second, 400 for the third, and it continues at 400 per 30 days after that. The inspectors have a sheet that they have to check their level three inspections that the supervisors provide them. Level four, once the commission up, makes a decision to uphold the inspector, to reverse the inspector, or to, if the case is withdrawn for compliance, those are, those are the ways the cases come off the commission's agenda. So once the case is upheld, it becomes a level four housing case. As a level four housing case, the monthly inspection uh, safety inspection goes to 90 days. Uh, at this time, reinspection fees are not applying to level four cases. That was a policy adopted by the department prior to my employment, and that's not yet been reviewed. 
the city ordinance appears to reflect that the reinspection fee for the safety inspection shall or should continue until compliance. And I'm not certain of the reasoning, but I would guess that the reasoning is if an investor wants to come in and, and rehabilitate a property that they are not being assessed reinspection fees. However, for safety and for the safety of the structure and the public, we are um, reinspecting these structures every 90 days and not assessing a fee. Now, the receivership initiative that we're going to also discuss, the, the demolition structures as well as the repair structures are eligible for receivership only after 90 days has expired after the, the commission has upheld a decision. Uh, so once those 90 days expires, expire, then they're eligible for the receivership initiative that we will discuss. In the housing services division, you have what's known as the lead safe housing program, the homeowners rehabilitation program, the rental rehabilitation program, and there's a newer program that we're working on, which will be for um, a focus toward investors. So here's what the phases look like shows you from complaint to the issuance of the order, the monitoring until the property is condemned. And I explained there's a whole lot of stuff that we've added in here to assist the homeowner with compliance, to assist them with um, um, financial needs. If they, if they qualify, if they're pre-1978, uh, if they need lead abated, um, then this phase right here is where we're going to uh, try to get every property assessed and try to get them all the financial assistance that they're that they're qualified for uh, and try to get this structure into compliance so we can avoid condemnation, which would lead to the displacement of a family. If we can rehabilitate the property while the family is in the structure safely, that is the goal rather than issue immediately issue condemnation, displacing the family um, and then letting it sit through the, the phase three and four. So phase three, the case is now in, um, has been referred to the housing commission for review. Uh, and this is a due process um, set in our process because the housing commission's review of the inspector's case, their evidence and their decision is important because you can reverse that if you find that the inspector in fact has not made a good decision that the violations that they're showing are not violations of the code you can take that action right here and provide relief to the property owner you can continue to make extensions you can provide extensions to the property owner uh, the ordinance does not limit your authority on any extensions you can extend for as long as you wish um, upon the decision of an upheld case, it would move to phase four, in which after 90 days, the city can utilize funding to demolish the structure or to repair the structure. And if we do that, we, we can demolish under a different order, uh, a different appropriation of funds by city council or enter the, enter the property into the receivership or if it's after this initiative of rehab, enter the property into rehab, the rehabilitation program. I won't belabor these points. This is, uh, I will send you at the end of this call, I'll send everybody a copy of this PowerPoint so that you'll have it by reference. Um, but I believe I've discussed all these individually. I probably should have went screen by screen. Um, but these just lays out uh, some of the conditions of the complaint, the, the time of an inspection. Now, right now, um, because of the volume of cases, we're not able to comply with this number of days. So we do, we make our best effort and we prioritize the cases based on life, health, and safety. The um, notice of hearings issued, the inspector hearing. So this kind of gives you what the timeline should look, would look like um, that were our goals that we're aiming toward in our policy. This is what a level two looks like up to 90 days. 
the first reinspection, the second and the third, and then the director's extension, and then the condemnation, issuance of the penalty, and the housing commission referral for level two. Level three, the referral packet. And we've moved this back to the start, back to the start of level two, uh, but the referral packet, reinspections, videos that we do prior to the housing commission, so that you can see all efforts made by the by the homeowner and the preparations of the inspector. So when the inspector visits the property, what they're doing now is that every housing commission. Well, this is a new uh, procedure. At every housing commission, the inspector is visiting the property with a copy of their violations in hand or on their, on their tablet. They have a discussion with the property owner or the property manager as to what they've done to remedy those violations. They inspect the structure with the owner and they try to correct as many violations as they can. Um, to put mark off the list because at the beginning we try to give the violation, let the violations serve as a punch list for the owner to work toward in gaining compliance. So they try, they do each one of these things. Then they video the structure. They'll make their case note in the system of their inspection and any improvements made. Uh, any action plans or what the owner says they can accomplish next. And then in preparation for the meeting, the, the inspector completes the fact sheet again, updating only the information that's new. They reprint the case notes that will have their new inspections, the, their, inspe or their comments from their interaction with the owner. They reprint their violation sheet which all of these have dates on them so you can tell when they get reprinted. And they also update the calculated worksheet. Uh, so if two violations were corrected and they go to the calculated, calculated worksheet and two things can be marked off, then they will mark it off and they will check it again. And on their fact sheet, if the improvements that the property owner has made now causes the, fact, the cost estimate to be less than 50%, then they will change their initial request for demolition to an order to repair. So we have put those, those conditions in place to be evaluated and reprinted two weeks prior to your housing hearing. Um, now, being that the two weeks prior, one of the things uh, that we, that I would want to just to share with y'all and let you know is that if you make a, if you provide an extension of 30 days, say we're in the month of October and you give an extension to November, our process that we have to go through meeting with each of the homeowners um, and updating these forms is now a two week process. So after the last meeting, after that, after your October meeting, the homeowner will have two weeks to do what they can toward compliance before the inspector is going to have to start their preparation process um, or is going to have to have submitted their preparation for the November meeting, which is due two weeks prior. So they're going to be working two week, the second week after, more than likely, meeting with home, homeowners. So if you're able to provide 60 day or more extensions, then that's that will be, I think, more beneficial to the homeowner. But that is all completely up to your discretion. We will put in the work, put in the inspections, and make sure the file is updated for your review so that you have the most complete, accurate information when you make your decision to uphold uh, any decision, any, uh, any action of the inspector. And you have level four, which we, we discussed earlier. So let's talk about the receivership pilot initiative. The program description, it is to preserve, it was created to preserve and increase the city's housing stock to improve the appearance of neighborhoods by improving or removing blighted properties 
and increase the availability of affordable housing. Currently, there are 139 upheld demolition orders by the commission and 68 upheld orders for repair by the commission. Code compliance will identify in this program 20 properties based on an analysis of property condition and value, their owner status, the areas of interest or high visibility, and identified property clusters. These will all go into a scoring value um, that will help us prioritize either in any of those properties. Code compliance will identify and select qualified entities to be recommended to the courts as receivers through a request for qualifications competitive process. That, pro that RFQ is being developed now and we are anticipating releasing it or issuing it on November the 3rd with a go date of January the 1st with qualified receivers um, ready to be appointed to any of the properties that we identify. The program process, so code compliance would complete an investigation or an inspection. The Minimum Housing Standards Commission would render an upheld decision. Assignment and appointment of a receiver would happen by the court. Now this, the second and the third step here is something that we'll need to communicate with the commission and figure out what the commission's preference is. The script for the commission, when you make an upheld decision, this is the script the chairman reads, that script can be updated to reflect your decision that, 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 your, that particular case or that every demo, demolition or order to repair case in which you adopt an ordinance to uphold the inspector's decision is eligible for the receivership program and the code compliance um, division is given authority to petition the court for a receiver. We can put that wording automatically into the script. Otherwise, what would happen is any cases that's currently on the list we would be delaying the process by bringing, by scheduling the case, get, having to get consent if we're still virtual, to bring the case back before the commission to, to make a formal uh, request. Can, the, can we pursue a receiver for this case in the Superior Court? There would be nothing for us to present to you except simply to make the, make the ask because we cannot petition the appointment of a receiver without the expressed um, consent of the Housing Commission. So that will be something that uh, I'd like for y'all to consider and think about. And then um, at your next meeting, um, you can share, or at the end of this one, you can share what you think your preference would be because myself and legal counsel will have to come up with what that wording would look like. Um, so just to reiterate that, that part is that the receivership program adopted by the city council cannot, we cannot use it to petition a, uh, a qualified receiver by the courts unless the housing commission directs the code compliance division to do so. Um, and once that's done, then we'll follow the remainder of that process present a property and what then the next qualified receiver on the rotation to a superior court judge and ask them uh, to appoint them as a receiver. Hey Troy. Yes. How does a person become a receiver? Huh? How does a person become a receiver? There is all right currently there's a request for qualifications like an RFP uh, that is being created. It's going to be, uh, it's in MWBE's review right now. Well, it's getting ready to go. I'm sorry, it's sitting right here on my desk. Um, it will be submitted and released on November the 3rd, uh, which we will send it out to all the, all the contractors that have requested to be notified now. All contractors that we are aware of, uh, we've been in contact with the Greensboro Business League, um, all the addresses and contacts that the MWBE provides us 
and placement on our website. So any, any sources where we can find or get in front of general contractors, private businesses, minority businesses, women-owned businesses, we're going to send this RFQ to them. Um, they, apply to the, they apply to the RFQ, mm -hmm. um, and then there's a, met, there's a matrix scoring system that's already that already has uh, certain scores uh, for their qualifications. And once they're qualified, then they are uh, issued an award uh, acceptance, and they be they become a they come onto a rotating uh, list, just as our nuisance abatement contractors are now. Our nuisance abatement contractors uh, that are on a rotation, when the next job comes in, it goes to the next contractor on that rotation list, uh, so that it's balanced among the rotation. That would happen in this this same manner. The next contractor available on the list would have an identified property. The contractor would prepare a plan of action to remedy the violations as listed in the upheld decision. Uh, and then we would present their qualification packet that they submit in this RFQ. We would submit that qualification packet as well as their plan of action on the property to a superior court judge and ask for that judge to appoint this qualified receiver to the property. The judge is not obligated to choose our recommendation. The judge can put whoever they want to. They can, uh, if it's a partnership on property, they can assign the, the other partner. If it's a, if it's a, par a property owned by uh, a husband and wife, they can assign it to one of them. Um, yeah, the, or the, the, the uh, statute lists uh, people eligible to be appointed by a receiver. So the judge can choose what's called a non-qualified receiver that does not meet the qualifications of the statute, or the judge can choose a qualified receiver. Now, if the judge chooses any receiver, whether it's our recommendation or whether the judge chooses a non-qualified receiver uh, or any other receiver, and they're not performing if they're not making progress, because we will monitor it each 30 days and continue our case notes. But if they're not performing, then we will reapproach the Housing Commission. We will give the Housing Commission a report. We will report any non performing that we're finding or that we're seeing. And then we will ask the Housing Commission to direct us to either one, continue monitoring and keep the commission updated on the next month or whenever, or we will ask the housing commission for the authority to petition the court to change the receiver by removing the receiver and suggesting again, our qualified receiver or another qualified receiver. Now, here's a question. You said that there already is a, uh, there's already people who have applied to be a receiver and I'll be quite candid with you. Um, I've actually been waiting to see and looking to see how this receivership program was going to start. How in the world were they able to find out the qualifications because they're not posted or listed anywhere? Or am I wrong? Are they posted or listed somewhere? Yeah, um, you've not. Okay, I'm back. Somebody's trying to get it. All right. So, no, um, no one has applied. So, what, happened, what has happened is the news article. Uh, where the city council uh, approved the receivership program sparked interest in contractors that have contacted our office. And what we started doing is we started compiling an Excel list of those persons or, or businesses that have contacted us that says, hey, when y'all when issue the RFQ, I would like to be um, invited to participate. So on that list, on that Excel list, there's approximately six contractors that have called us. Um, a lot of people have called since that news article, um, but I do not know their qualifications. Uh, they do not know what the qualifications are uh, because the RFQ has not yet been released. The only knowledge they could have would be from the news article or their own independent research of the general statute. The qualifications in the RFQ follow strictly the stat, the general statute. Um, because when we submit that information to the judge, 
we're going to submit their financial information, their certifications, their licenses, um, their knowledge and experience, because the um, the RF, the statute says that the person or entity must have knowledge and experience to do the job. They must have the financial ability and capabilities to perform the job and complete it. Um, and I think those are the main points. They're, those are listed in like four points. Um, so the RFQ is developed around uh, the statute to identify qualified receivers. And it is, it is designed in a way not to um, eliminate or restrict or hinder any business or person to, to apply. We want receivers that have the knowledge experience, builders, uh, non, nonprofits. There's a nonprofit that has expressed an interest and that this expression came a while back. A, a, people, a person from the uh, housing coalition, you know, they heard that, they heard talk about a receivership and they're like, if this ever comes to comes to fruition, we want to be a part of it. Um, so why, we're just making notes right now. The reason why I ask, ask is, is we put that in the verbiage um, for when we're voting, but we don't know what the RFQ is or what the receivership uh, or what the receivers or qualified receivers are. We could be in essence, for all practical purposes, taking minority owned properties that are in distress and basically giving them to non-minorities um, or majority ownership. And that's why I'm wondering, like, I guess we need to see who the receivers are because I can be can quite candid with you. What is the minority rate of the nuisance abatement contractors that you have on file currently? The, uh, well, currently there are none. Okay. The, uh, so the contracts are expired. So with on nuisance, so boarding up stuff is not going to any of the minority companies that are in the city which i'm sure would love to be able to have that opportunity so right. before we put wording and verbiage together and legal counsel and them kind of push that towards a judge which most of the time will side with what the council or commission goes with we need to know who and what these individuals are and we need to know the the, the level of diversity in in what we're doing we need to know that okay. i think maybe maybe someone on the commission else can weigh in now the pro the process would not be uh, it would it would not be where the commission would be choosing the receiver. Um, that's not that's not written in the process. Instead, what what's the way the RFQ is written is that the initial award notification for the qualified receivers during the initial process they would be placed in an alphabetical order by the business name by the first business of their name or the first um, person's name, uh, if, it, if the business is the name or if it's just the entity. Now, we have written the RFQ so that that is not limiting only to those that want to take a chance in participating in the program in the beginning. Um, we hope that it gains an interest by other people. Uh, we hope that it gains an in interest in MWB businesses to join or want to be a receiver. So in the first, in the first phase, after the, or when the initial award notif uh, notification is, is granted, those businesses are placed in the alphabetical order as they are with the nuisance rotation. That is the um, uh, conditions that have been adopted or approved, not adopted, approved uh, by the MWB uh, department here for the city. Now, after the initial award notification, I, written, I had written a clause into it and it has to be first approved by MWBE. And that clause leaves open enrollment. And in an open enrollment, that basically allows any future business or company to submit the same information. Uh, there's a scoring mechanism to score 60 points, same as the business, same as the initial process. Um, if the if the business contract or whatever scores the 60 on the uh, matrix scoring system, then they are eligible to enter into a contract with the city to become a qualified receiver. Once that happens, they're placed after the last name of the initial award um, notification. They're not included. In, they're not. 
it does it does not reorganize the alphabetical of the initial um, award. So that basically after that you have a first come first serve, next one on the list. And then as properties are identified, if you have 20 properties and all 20 properties are scored and we have the highest scoring property, you know, which is your highest need property, say you have a property that scores 25 points and then 23, 19, 18, and 10, if 25 points is the highest scoring property, then that property is gonna be given to the first contractor on the rotation. The next, the next rank property would go to the next contractor on rotation so that it goes like a round robin, one right after the other one. It doesn't pick and choose a contractor that it goes to, Instead, it balances the opportunity. And once it reaches the end of the list, it cycles back up to the first contractor and it continues through the list in that manner. And the, I, the I pilot, go ahead. Yeah, that makes sense. I just wanna make sure that all the list of contractors ain't, ain't non-minorities. You see what I'm saying? Right, and, like, and it is certainly the city, the, the city's manager's direction to the departments is also to ensure um, that, that we increase uh, vast majority opportunities to MWB business, and that is definitely uh, on the front line of what we're looking that, at and what our goal is. We look at the nuisance abatement right now. That's uh, what you say. There's no minority contractors on there. No, 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 not, no, not, not, no, not none. I'm sorry uh, if I if if you misunderstood me. Right now, all contracts expired on September the 30th. We're waiting okay. on we're waiting on our new contracts to come in from. Uh, the procurement division, which is managing that process. So right now I don't have any valid contracts. In the previous process, there's 17 contractors and five businesses were MWBE certified uh, contractors. In the, new, now, in, the, in the new rotation, 15, um, 15 contractors applied and 15 contractors were awarded to become nuisance contractors in the next two year period. Four of those uh, businesses have been told, or we've been informed by MWB that they have their certification. And one of those businesses had let theirs expire. So they're trying to get that certification back. And one of the things that we're also, that I'm working with MWB trying to do is we, a lot of our contractors that are on our rotation are minority business owners. Uh, so I'm working with Allison Stanton uh, and Gwen in MWBE trying to get them certified through HUB so that the city can uh, get their credit of uh, awarding contracts to MWB businesses. Um, so that's, so when I've spoken with them, they also have shared that they have realized that as well. And that is a function of MWBE is to help those businesses uh, gain that certification. What well, one of why I'm bringing it up again is, is you know, last year's abatement, last year's nuisance abatement um, basically didn't have hardly any minorities. And when you say MWBE, that doesn't necessarily mean minorities. What it means is minorities or women owned businesses. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a black company that owns it. It could, it could very easily be a white company who's who has a woman CEO, which in my, in my, I mean, I understand that the office, that's what they do, but sometimes people can cheat the system by doing that. And it, that, that's a whole nother level in itself. But what we don't wanna do, well, what I, what I like to make sure is that when we start putting this wording into our script, is that we're not out here basically giving receivership of um, giving receiverships to a program that is basically giving away minority owned houses that especially being black houses or Hispanic houses to white receivers because they can't afford to repair it. And that's important. Now, that one we, of the things, one of the things I also keep in mind, um, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, one of the things you're saying is I'm hearing giving away. Receivership does not take ownership away from anyone. All it does it, is with a court order by the judge, they're granting control of the property only to the receiver. The receiver doesn't take it and the city doesn't take it. They grant control. financial control, right? Like if you, if, if I had receivership of your house that you live in right now, I theoretically could rent your house out and make money off of it while 
I'm waiting for you to pay back the, the cost of my repair that I had to do to your house. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So if you take my, if you, if you were assigned a receivership to my property and based on the ordinance adopted by the commission, um, it, our cost estimate sheet may be $15,000 to repair it. And we know that that's a low number. That's not a market value number. So it's going to be higher. And you invest 19 to 20,000 of your own dollars into my property. If when taxes come due, you'll have to pay those taxes for this property. And anything you pay, your fees, your labor, your equipment costs, your attorney fees, anything you pay to help uh, remedy my property of these code violations, you're allowed to place those as a receiver's lien on the property that is not going to fall off. It is going to be ranked second to the initial uh, or to, to government taxes. It's first after government taxes so that you get your money back. Now, the receiver is allowed to remain in control of the property for two years, no more than two years after rehabilitation. And during that two years, if it is a residential property, the receiver, the, uh, receiver can rent. They can put a tenant in the property and collect rent for that property in which that rent must go toward the eighteen to twenty thousand dollars that you have invested in your own money. After the two years, when the two-year period is up, the receiver has to report back to the court. They will report their financial um, collectings of the property, their rent. Uh, they'll see their liens, and if they have not yet collected in their rent all monies that they have put into that property, that they have put against it as a lien. If they've not yet collected them, then the judge the judge will see what the balance is to the property owner. So if over a two year period you collect rent and you have gotten back 15,000 of the 20 you invested, then you have a balance of $5,000. The owner of that property at that time can pay the $5,000 lien because the, the lien, the receiver can foreclose on their lien, but the owner can come up and pay $5,000, pay the lien on and, um, and be done. Or if it's 5,000 or more, then the, um, the owner of the property can exchange their deed to the property to the receiver in lieu of the receiver, of the owner having to pay anything, no matter what the amount is. So at the end of two years, if you don't have enough money to be able to pay that, the court could grant the person who owns, who is the receiver, the deed to the property. Is that also true? The, the court would not grant it in that manner. The receiver would, would have to file a foreclosure and it would have to follow a foreclosure, pen, a cl foreclosure um, process where not only the receiver can be a bidder, but anyone else can also bid. And that's what I'm saying. So basically, if you can't pay the bill, which some people might not be able to pay at the end of two years, you could lose your house. The alternative, the alternative is a dilapidated and deteriorated structure remains in the community that is already growing with blight. That's the alternative. I understand. I just and like I like I said earlier, I want to make sure that poor black people aren't losing their house because they can't afford to fix it up. And a person who has the means, usually wealthy can come in and fix the property and say, all right, well, you're going to owe me. And at the end of two years, if you can't pay this off, I'm going to foreclose on this and get my money out of it. Probably, most likely I'll get your house. And, and that's, that's the benefit. And that's the benefit. And that's, that's kind of the benefit of a fair process. And that is how the RFQ is designed so that the property, it's not a, it's not a hand picked property. The contractors or qualified receivers are not hand picking anything. We're gonna we're gonna do it by score, and we're gonna do it by rotation, and the stars the stars will align for whomever. It gives these contractors these receivers those opportunities, and anyone can apply to become a qualified receiver. Any nonprofit, even a person that's not a general contractor, can apply because the receivership the RFQ allows. Um, 
points for them if they have to, if they're going to employ a general contractor or if they're going to subcontract a general contractor. And in the receivership itself, I have taken the second option in points, you know, you know, in, on a matrix, you have the highest point value and you have the second point value. I have taken the second point value in all categories to ensure that a, a score of 60 is not unreachable. So um, you have a you have a, a scoring opportunity of 100 points. You don't have to be a general contractor to have 60 points. You can be a regular person who just has a really good, strong plan and ability to manage and still get 60 points. That's correct. Yes, 60 points is actually a, a lower number. When I when I take the second option and, and move through, even with the M MWB option or the MWB contractor or use of the bonus points on one of the categories, I come up with 65 points. So the uh, what's, put, what's being placed in the RFQ is 60. If we go below 60, what you're giving up is you're giving up experience, knowledge, or the financial capabilities of a person to actually follow through with the receivership. Okay, got you. All right. The, um, so then we have the, the rest of the process is monitoring the receiver's progress. And like I said, this is where we will continue to uh, provide updates, whether it is an agenda item uh, that we put as a regular item just to keep the commission uh, um, aware of, uh, of the progress uh, in this new initiative. Uh, and, if we, and if they stop performing, then we're going to try to catch it early and find out why and bring it to you to get your permission to ask the courts the assignment of a new receiver. If the courts remove our receiver or any other receiver, the next available receiver on rotation is going to be who we recommend. Um, if you recommend to pursue to petition the court for a change in receiver, then we will pull the next available uh, contractor that's on rotation to make that recommendation. And then receiver forecloses on the lien or is relieved by the courts. If the if the receiver has collected um, all the monies that they invested into the property back then the courts will relieve the receiver and transition the control back to the prop back to its property owner. Um, so the program outline, your level four housing cases are the only eligible cases for receivership. <clears throat> housing commission approves the property for receivership program and authorizes neighborhood development to petition the superior court for an approved receiver. The scoring process prioritizes the properties. Qualified contractors prepare a plan of action. The legal, requ legal request appointment of the approved receiver to superior court. So the legal uh, city attorney's office or outside legal counsel, whichever one will represent um, the request of the commission to the courts. Receiver begins rehabilitation of the property the receiver completes rehabilitation of the property and the court finalizes the process. So once the court appoints a receiver, that receiver is now accountable to the superior court judge that appointed them and must make 30 uh, monthly reports to that judge um, or longer. It all depends what the judge decides. The qualifications of a receiver is the financial ability to complete the purchase or rehabilitation of the property, the knowledge and experience in rehabilitation of vacant property, the ability to obtain the necessary insurance, and the absence of any building code violations on other real property owned by the proposed receiver, any member, principal, officer, major stockholder, parent, subsidiary, predecessor, or other affiliated with the proposed receiver or the receiver's business. That is exactly out of the statute. We did not enter anything else into that paragraph. Now, we believe that this is gonna be a challenge uh, and we will face that challenge when it comes, uh, when we discuss this with council and council share, um, um, 
our stance with the Superior Court judge that an investor that is coming in to uh, to um, to address, you know, investors purchase uh, properties uh, from owners that's on the condemnation list in order to rehab them uh, and sell them. Um, so an investor that purchases a property that's vacant might already own a property that has a code violation issued by the city, but maybe this would not apply if they were not directly uh, violating the code, the building code itself. So this is gonna be an interpretation challenge for us when we start talking with the Superior Court judge and we will work with the legal team um, to put our best foot forward and try to get the Try to get a receiver appointed if you request one to be report appointed. So Troy, the, the Troy, this is Carolyn. I have yes. a, a, a concern from the very first about receivership. If um, I, I hate to see us, and I realize you're saying that this that you're going to try to get some things changed, but if we are not able to have receivers who have any kind of code violation, then we just cut out some of the major investors who do some of the really good work because they go in, you know, and buy properties and, and there there are code violations until they get things going. And that's what we're and that's what we're I'm hoping. Really and that's what we're hoping the legal team will argue for us is that by the way the statute is read is that the absence of building code violations, and, and when you go in to read the statute in which the, the builder or these persons have been cited with a building code violation. So this is specifically what the statute says. So we cannot exclude it and we can't change it. And the Superior Court judge has to make a decision based upon it. So we're gonna give them as much information um, about the qualifications of the receiver so the judge can make that decision. But I, but I agree with you. This is one of the hurdles that we are going to have to figure out how the judge is going to look at it. How do, we, how do we frame that an investor that purchases or that investor that, when I say purchase property, we're talking about they purchase other property. They oh, already right. own, sure. they already own uh, dilapidated property that they simply purchase for the purpose of fixing it up and uh, and putting it back on the market or, or whatever their goal is, can that person or that business be a qualified receiver? Um, so that's that's the challenge for the legal team uh, okay. and for us to try to um, try to discuss that with the judge and and legal counsel can. Uh, Ms. Presley can, can chime in if, um, if there's anything to add or if there's any point that I'm missing. But well, those are conversations that's generally had with the judge uh, to argue whether it exists or whether it does not exist. Well, I would make one suggestion just to consider Jasmine and, and you, Troy, when you're doing this. If there's a way to look at the history of the people that are applying for the receivership, such as um, how fast have they taken care of former code violations? How serious are they? If there's just a way to do that, then you would know pretty much if you had somebody who would do the right thing with the property. Right. If, if you can, you know, as long as we can't change this, because this has bothered me from the very first. I mean, I was so delighted when the state did what they did with the receivership. But this is this is the thing that could keep us from having some of the folks that um, both that have been very successful here and some of the folks we'd like to attract to Greensboro from surrounding areas. So just just wanted to throw that out. And I don't want to take any more time up from the training, but thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for all you're doing with this. This could be really important and get uh, some of some of our uh, neighborhoods in much better shape. Right. So I think you accurately covered it. It would be a, basically an argument that obviously they wouldn't have any current um, outstanding code violations, but that that is an issue with you know investors taking on you know 
properties that weren't in good condition at the time of the purchase. And that's just an argument that'll be made in court. Well, and also as a former landlord way a long time ago, one of, one of my histories, uh, part of my history, you, you can, I, I, I was always fortunate with wonderful tenants, but you can have, as we all know, um, tenants that, that for whatever reason will choose to, um, you know, call in code violations, you know, call in code violations. And uh, I just, just think if we could get the overall history, besides exactly what's going on right at the moment, we, we could get some really wonderful folks to be involved. So thanks, thanks again for all you're doing for that. That, that can be a big step for us. But definitely, Troy, um, I was listening to what Carolyn was saying. I have to chime in and hopefully Andrew will back me up on it. What we don't want to do and what the commission doesn't want to do is basically make it a, a receivership program of majority wealthy investors who have enough money to who don't live in these areas that have enough money to rehab these properties. And like I said, in two years, end up owning them or are displacing individuals who are poor or minority owned. Like what we don't want to do is, is do that at all. I mean, I definitely agree with Carolyn on having some on some of the big investors, but you know, we don't want to, we don't want to sell whole neighborhoods or sides of a city to another side. And I think that's important because I mean, let's be candid as we're sitting here talking about the type of people that have the money to put that in there are not the average individuals working on the side, working every day or doing what else. Most of the people to put money in 20 and $30,000 into a property are going to want their money back. That, that's logical. They're not just giving away. And it's something that we need to be looking into as a commission that we create a very fair and even and level playing field so that there is no sides or races that have a majority or the ability to be one up by whatever. I mean, even if, even if a receiver was able to get a loan from a bank, it's been shown that banks have been non have been less than fair to minorities. That's, 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 that's quite obvious. If not, I mean, there's a lot of articles that have been written on that. Recently, the uh, Harvard Times or the Harvard Business Review talked about how banks and other places have basically segregated against minority owners, which in essence starts a domino effect to allow opportunity. But we don't want to just have, this is what this is, is an opportunity. A, it helps the city get properties back up and running. B, it helps it helps be able to, uh, sorry, somebody call me. B, it helps, it helps us to be able to to uh, also create opportunity in building and such, but we want to make sure that it's a very fair and even playing field so that the I, rich get richer. I understand your point. And if you, if you want to take more time to think about it, and like Troy said, he's going to provide everybody with a copy of the slideshow. Perhaps we could decide, you know, whether the language is included in the ordinance and what that may look like at the next meeting. And we'll pull something together as staff on what that could look like um, so that y'all could let us know if you want that to come into your standard. Uh, because otherwise, if, if you're making up, if you're upholding decisions and only moving certain cases, making certain cases eligible, then now we're gonna have decisions that have been scored, decisions that have not been scored, and it's gonna become a complicated process to where now properties are being, um, chosen or neighborhoods are being chosen to participate in receivership or not participate in receivership. Um, and, and that could that could be um, problemsome for our accountability on our side, but we'll we'll do whatever the commission uh, wishes to do. Uh, are y'all I shared my screen. Are you able to see the statute on my screen? Is that what you see? All right. Yeah, the language yeah. is the same. Yeah. Yeah. I highlighted the section here. And the reason I was saying that we would be working with the legal team to make this argument for us is if you notice exactly what the statute says is the absence of any building code violation issued by the city on any real property owned by the person. So when I read this, if an investor purchases a property and the property already has code violations, then that investor was not issued a violation notice by the city, meaning they're not a contributor to the violation unless of course they purchase it and never 
fix it. And at that point, we would be issuing something more to them. Um, but this is going to be the part where we're going to work closely with our legal team to see if they will make can make this argument to the judge if the judge finds uh, that it is an issue. So that is our, um, um, that's what we anticipate. So that's how we wish to overcome that. But I wanted to cover this with y'all to make sure you knew that that is a condition in the statute. Therefore, it is listed in the RFQ. Thank you. Uh, hey, Troy, um, can I just ask a question here? Just um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, when it comes to the when it comes to the formal role of the commission, um, we will pretty much be either okaying the city to move ahead with a petition or not. Right? We don't do we we don't get to make any recommendations as to how the city's going to argue before the court, right? That's correct. Okay. And would, so, would we would we have any ability for the receivership program to say that there's a certain portion of the people investing in the receivership program that have to come from districts one and two? What was the last part? I heard everything except the last couple words. Uh, to, to Quentin's point, which I think was a good one about not having, you know, one side of town owning the other side of town, could we say that for this program, a certain percentage of investors coming over to fix things have to be from districts one and two? So, go ahead, Troy. I, I, don't, I don't know how we would be able to get contractors that would be from a specific district um, because what's happening is in an RFP and RFQ process, any person, entity, or contractor, or business, uh, or nonprofit is able to apply to the RFQ. And what's going to happen is you can, the way that I've got it set with the transparency of the process, I've removed the subjectivity of the contractor, meaning that you could look at the RFQ, look at the scoring and see based upon the qualifications as to whether or not, as to what you're gonna score. You're gonna see that ahead of time. So when you, so when you submit your, all of your documents and everything, you will already, you should already know yourself whether or not you're going to score 60, 65, 70 or more. Uh, could, could we add a criteria that district one or two investors get extra points on their score? All right. So the are you asking that they, if the investor is residing? Correct. Or if their business is located? Correct. Uh, if it's a business investor, business located, according to the Secretary of State filings, private investor based on their residence. All right. So let me ask this question. If now there is there are points in the system that give local it's a local preference policy uh, mm -hmm. and it grants five points which is businesses that are here in Greensboro, Guilford County, or they have invested like a dollar figure, I think like 500,000 or, or more. Let me make sure I don't just quote myself. Um, an eligible, let's see, local preference policy is all bidders that have significant business presence for at least one year within the corporate limit of the municipality which com which comprise the Guilford County Economic Development Alliance, uh, High Point, Guilford County, local area are eligible bidders pursuant to this policy. A bidder has significant business presence in the local area if it is headquartered in the local area for at least one year or it has at least 25% of its total full-time, part-time, and contract employees regularly based in the local area for at least one year or bidders at least 500,000 in gross sales uh, in the local area within the 12 months preceding 
the city's advertisement for bids to the general contractors from that specific contract. If they qualify there, the local preference policy grants a score of five points and they must uh, complete the certification form for that. And I guess what what if we had similar language for an additional five points if the same criteria apply to districts one and two? Um, and Quentin, I'd be I'd be interested in hearing your input on this. Basically, saying if if you're from districts one and two, we're going to give you a, a preference to invest in your own community. Oh yeah, I definitely agree with Peter on this one. Um, I'll be quite candid uh, with the. Uh, with uh, Troy and them, you know, I'm gonna be honest in, in a couple of different levels. So on the upper level, you wanna have the most certified individuals, right? So you wanna have that. Now we're gonna look at it from a, from, a, from a macro view. The most of the people that you just described on there don't own businesses or don't have the ability to have that level of scrutiny with their income who are small business owners. And a lot of them, I can almost tell you, there's probably hardly any general contractors out here now that are minority owned. And when I mean by minority, I'm not talking about white women owned. I'm talking about black owned or Hispanic owned. That's what we consider, that's what I'm, that's where I'm at, that would be able to have some of the criteria that where it is. So it's like in our wordings, in our wording, we need to be able to make that opportunity more open. We shouldn't have but so many points for what I consider certificate points, because you'd be amazed and how many companies don't have the finances to quote unquote have a certificate. We would like to have it that way, but there's a lot of big companies that don't have a certain level of certificates. So if we make the, if we make the verbiage so difficult to achieve it that only the super wealthy or the well, um, or the well finance can afford it, then we're going to start to see a trickle effect, almost like a funneling that is only going to certain areas. And um, I definitely agree with Peter that, you know, people, if you're in a district, I feel like there should be a high level of points to say, hey, I would like to take on this project because I live in this area and this is in my community, 100%. And I think if you do that and you open it up to people who have the ability or people who, who want to give it a try, I think you're going to have a much more diverse group of, of, of applicants as opposed to you know, some applicants that are what I call cert certificate certificate or credentialed out. They just don't have the credential and they're not so, going to be able to well, get it. So to that, po to that point... Uh, and what, what Commissioner Brown is saying. Uh, and Just, Commissioner Young, you, we can't hear you. Can you hear us? Or not a huge amount, but a bunch more points to uh, living in districts one and two, whatever the language might be, significant business presence, whatever the language is used. Just adding more points. Or an al alternative to get the same conclusion, what if we said the requirements that are laid out currently, the, you know, uh, capital and all that requirements apply to everyone within the city of Greensboro outside of districts one and two, and there are relaxed requirements for districts one and two with the idea of if you live in the community, you might not have as much resources as other people, but you have the buy-in with this being your community. So we'll give you a little bit more leeway in terms of the criteria for qualifying for this program. I agree with Peter on that one. That's a good, that's a good, good way to put that, Peter. I really, really appreciate how you put that. All right. Now at, this, at the same time, I'm trying to, I'm trying to wrap my head around with my note here. Um, because I, I'll have to I'll take this back and figure out if we can do it when we're looking at a RFQ process because one of the things of distinguishment is all the properties that have been upheld by the commission are not just in two districts. Um, so if, if, you, if you gave a value, a point value to a business that was from a district in which that district contained more than a percentage of the upheld decision, um, I was trying to figure out how all five districts would have an opportunity, because when you, if you, if there is a condition that only favors district one and two, then what about the ones for district three, four, and five? Um, and if you make the percentage so great, mm -hmm. how does that 
how does that um, um, off balance? What so if we? We'll, so we'll have to also run it. We'll also have to run it by the business practices to see, you know, to make sure that it doesn't hurt. Anyone. What What if we said? if you reside in or do substantial business in the same language that you, we have currently, if you reside or do business in the district where the property is located, you get extra points in this algorithm, this schematic. But we'll never know. We will never know which property. That's the, that's the key. Mm -hmm is that in the RFQ, in the request for qualification process, we're putting a request out there to identify um, receivers and, and understand one of the, what this process does or what we're doing is we're kind of doing the work up front for the court system. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have to have qualified receivers. All we have to do is, um, is the commission say, hey, Mr. This case is eligible for receiver. We asked Jasmine, Jasmine, will you go to a superior court judge and ask to assign a receiver to this property? If we have no plan and we have no recommended receivers or nothing qualified, then the courts are not, this is not new to them. They assign receivers to bankruptcy properties, to um, foreclosed properties. It's just the person of assignment that that's like a trustee to make sure that the property is, is, you know, is, is in compliance with the law or whatever condition that judge sets. So mm -hmm. this is just a process to identify qualified receivers. And once they're qualified, it doesn't delay the process. So we already have a pool that will go in an established rotation to create um, undoubtedly no favoritism in the it rotation. What if, and, and, and I get the criteria of trying to be fair to everyone, and I also get Quentin's point of you don't want one side of town buying the other side of town. What if we said there were a two-tier application? If you only want to be eligible for bids in your district, here's the requirements. If you want to be eligible for bids in any property within city limits, then here's the, and the, that's the higher requirements that we have currently. So some people, some business owners could apply and say, I only want to invest in district one and they meet lower monetary requirements. What I'm hearing is maybe um, instead of a, uh, qualifications that cover all five districts, mm -hmm. uh, it's localized, right? Per district, yeah. say. An incentive to be localized by district. The way we, the way we do all the RFP, we, it has to be uniform. We can't, we could create a process that encourages the most minority, the most women-owned participation. I do understand that, you know, sometimes majority contractors use their wives as, as the face to, to overcome that obstacle. I do realize that is an issue, but the way that we apply it, it has to be a uniform process. And I think that the way that it's been outlined <clears throat> achieves that goal. Um, even with the selection of the businesses, or I'm sorry, the receivers, they would be, they would be rotated. What we don't want, um, because it's also been an issue in the city in the past, is us, me as the department, I know I have a good relationship with this contractor. I'm gonna pick this contractor to go to do this project because I know the contractor can get the job done, which is a valid reason for wanting to send that person out there, but it's not giving someone else, maybe the small minority business owner who just doesn't have, have the opportunity, a chance to come in and do that. So we put a program in place and we just rotate it. We don't. We don't like to hand, because then there can arguments can be made by different contractors that they're not receiving, you know, an opportunity to to fairly participate. Has has this process been um, minimally like focus group tested with uh, 
prospective um, uh, firms, individuals, businesses that 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 might be interested? Has any of this stuff been uh, not just placed before them to get their feedback, but at least walk through to see just from an actual how it might play out as we try to anticipate this or that and 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 as as Commissioner Brown was saying, not just make this a big uh, opportunity for 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 well to do well established businesses to to jump in. Has this been in any way run through in, in kind of a live testing? All right, so the live testing is in this pilot. So the city council is provided with the program guidance and executive summary uh, that they approved for a pilot initiative. And so a, a pilot, pilot, excuse me, but a pilot means it's gonna be, it's gonna be tested and then it's gonna be reviewed to see if it works or not? Absolutely. Uh, okay, so I guess that as long as everyone understands fully that this is going to be I think you froze again. I think it's gotten out there. To whether it's just, whether it's truly working, uh, whether all the business is just basically going to some very, very well-to-do folks, and so on and so on. Is, is that really clear in the language and in the process? All right, you broke out. I might not have gotten everything that you said. Sorry. Uh, can you just say exactly what the uh, process of a pilot versus a approved program is? Well, the pilot program allows us to um, um, to follow through with the pro uh, to do the program that the city council approved, um, and the qualifications part is based upon the general statute. Now, in the pilot means that it's not a full-blown program at this time. We need to see what works, what don't work, what can we make changes to to um, to make it and to see whether or not it needs to be a program. Uh, what do we shape? That's that's what a pilot, that's what the pilot initiative is all about. This is a pro this is a general statute that the legislature has approved in October of 2018 and and no and no municipality has been willing to try it. But if you go through with the house like the housing commission when you uphold a decision to demolish or a decision to uphold there's what's the there's nothing else to do mm -hmm. you know like when i came here in june 1st the house just sits on the list and and it just sits there until yeah uh, I, tax dollars are you know appropriated to fix them themselves so the receiverships seem to be you know the most attractive solution to help create affordable um safe affordable housing in the neighborhoods where the neighborhoods are wanting these blighted structures uh repaired yeah, I think I, I mean, I, I, I understand the, I think we all understand the problem. I just want to be clear. Uh, is there a formal review process when it comes to a pilot? It'll be reviewed by the neighborhood development department. Yes. Is that, so, is that a structured thing? Is like, does it happen after three months, six months, or after a certain amount of cases go through? Is there a certain criteria or? It will be after 20 cases. The pilot, the pilot has 20 cases. Got it. Here's what I would say on that, on that short little, uh, the short little change we just had. If it takes five years, 10 years to get it right, then that's how long it takes. But I don't feel like we should rush or be worried about, um, you know, I don't think we should rush any type of the process. This right here is the beginning parts. And, you know, Troy had a good point. Once we vote on it, that's it. And I've been a strong proponent of if that's the case. Then we need to keep it going. We need to make sure that people aren't losing, aren't losing. For some people, this is all their family has. You got to look at it from those standpoints. Now, granted, it's not in the greatest, greatest state. And I understand that. But I don't feel just because something's not in the greatest state that you should lose it. And there, right here, this program that we're talking about right now has the ability to massively change the wealth standard in the city because of what I consider aesthetics. 
And that's really what we're talking about here. We got to make sure I understand how we vote, but this is kind of what we spoke about last year to some of the commissioners who were on the board that our vote really does matter because he had a good point. Like once we're done, we're done with it. I mean, theoretically the courts could do what they want to with it. So maybe it's in our best interest to maybe not always uphold. Sometimes we got to look past the move to maybe five or six moves down the way and just wait till the taxpayers can either a repair it or be demolish it in some shape, shape, form or fashion. Cause like I said earlier, if you're not careful, one side of town will own another side of town. That has happened. And many of these receivership programs have had issues like what we're talking about right now. It's going on right now in New York. And it happened in Miami a couple years ago about how one, how the black side of town was literally getting bought up by the white side of town because people couldn't afford these vast bills. And it's something that we need to definitely take a high amount to look into. Quentin, tell me, tell me what you think of this. I see this as kind of analogous to a university affirmative action program, right? And, which is perfectly valid. I'm actually on my alma mater, University of Virginia's um, affirmative action section of its website. So you can give preference. We can't have quotas that certain people be of a certain race. But what you can say is the term is underutilized class, which means there is a class of people that their proportion of the population is not adequately represented in a certain, you know, in this case, and in, in the university student population. What about language like universities put in their rules saying if you are a, of an underutilized race, that there is some sort of preference for you to come in to this receivership program, similar to if you're under if you're in an underutilized if you're an underutilized race, there is a certain preference given to you when applying to university. I hundred percent agree with you. Peter. Uh, well, you the, know, the, if you're an MWBE, if you're a minority, or I mean, or a woman, you there are additional points assigned for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking more towards towards having the same thing for racial identification. Definitely, I, I agree with Peter. You know, you you definitely are the uh, consummate uh, consummate <laughs> attorney, and you have the good verbiage. I, guess, like I, say, I, I say it like this, like my uncle said, I can't. Talk, but I get your point, and I understand what you're saying, because you know, I've literally stayed up at night and thought about this receivership program. Once I saw that it cleared, I've read. The packet cover to cover, cover to cover. And I'm be honest with you, it's it's very scary when you sit back and really read what's happening. Now, I agree with Troy that we need to get, you know, the dilapidated structures up and running and with Carolyn that, you know, we should have affordable housing for everyone. I just want to make sure that we don't take away, you know, wealth building stations for minorities, especially because, I mean, that's really where a lot of this stuff is really going to kind of, a, I think it's going to have an explosion in your first 20 cases. I think a lot of people are going to really start buying up district one and district two, but like, I really believe that. And what I mean by buying up, I think they can, they have the, the resources to turn it around pretty quickly to get it repaired, especially since the construction industry is booming. And what's gonna happen is in two years, you're gonna see the ownership start changing hands because people just aren't gonna be able to pay the bill. And that's a little scary to me. I don't, I just don't feel like people should lose something because they don't, because they fell on hard times. Um, so just the, and Commissioner Brown, one of the things now that since June 1st, when I came in 2019 that I've not seen is I'm not seeing anybody buying up properties off the demolition or repair list. The numbers have stayed constant. We've had a couple investors that have reached out to those property owners and offered to purchase the property and, and fix it up and, and sell it, but the numbers are not decreasing in such vast amounts. Um, we're hoping, we're hoping that this- a lot, of people wanna, uh, a lot of people want more than what it's probably worth. And those investors are just like, ah, but this is a way to supersede that. What this receivership program can do is, is a court will tell you, you can get it. And you can just make a bill that a person can't pay. And you know they can't pay it. And that, that's what's scary. That, that's what's kept me up at night. Like, well, I don't really have to negotiate with you what is worth to you. Now I can just go to the court and just bypass you. And I can put you in a position where if you can't pay what is owed to me, I can then foreclose on your house, get what's owed to me, and most likely get your house because I'll be the one who knows about it and who can bid on it. And that's, that's the part that's kind of scary that I don't want to see people lose their namesake. Now, I, I agree with you though, that uh, you know some people don't want to, I mean, people don't want to sell their house no matter what condition, because it is the only wealth building egg that they probably have in their repertoire. 
And so they're going to try to get as much money out of whatever it is. That's the American way. But what we're doing now is we're using the courts to size. And it's a little, that's a little dangerous and scary. Okay. Um, there is more to the presentation uh, for the rest of the training um, that I'd like to get to. The RFQ is a process. It has, it's at its final process being reviewed by MWBE before we have to make it public. Uh, issued for no, for November the third, the um, the part the condition the part that was listed earlier that was delegated to the housing commission is not the selection of the receiver and not the selection of the property, but simply whether or not a receiver whether or not a property is eligible for receivership uh, or for uh, the city to solicit the appointment of a receiver, um, and that's the part where the you know. The, uh, the commission would be asked, uh, can a receivership be appointed to a property? And I guess in the same, in the same token, if, if all properties in, in a specific district, um, if the commission does not want those properties to go to receivership, then the commission, that's the commission's decisions um, as the property is put before the commission. Because what is that? What is was simply delegated to you by what I've read on the council order is that the housing commission can solicit a receiver from the superior court, and those receive those properties are only the housing level four cases. Um, so when when the request is made, uh, if you want that property to be eligible for receivership, then that would be the commission's um, wishes and their decision. All right. Um, I see a question. Let me just look at the chat real quick. Um, Commissioner Young had asked a question. Does the commission hear non-residential cases? The answer is yes. Commission hears re residential and non-residential. Uh, before the gun repair ordinance was adopted, the chief building inspector represented those properties. Um, one city official is, um, is enough to initiate a complaint is a housing commission commissioner a city official? That would be a question for Jasmine. Is a city is a city of I think the city official, uh, as listed earlier, is a public officer. So the question to Jasmine is a commissioner a public officer of the city? Let me confirm. Okay. Uh, so that question comes from Commissioner Young. Okay. And the other question from Commissioner Young, how many hard number of cases receive a director's extension? Um, I don't have that number and the, there's not enough cases. Uh, I would say since I've been here, I've seen 12 um, director extensions. And I believe that's all the questions I see in the chat. All right, so in lieu of a receiver, now the court may appoint an owner, a mortgagee, or other party in interest. So in lieu of a receiver, if that person demonstrates an ability to complete rehabilitation or demolition within a reasonable time, agrees to comply with a specified schedule, and post a bond in an amount determined to be sufficient security for performance of the work, within the specified schedule. So this is where I was telling you earlier that a, the court may appoint someone else other than a qualified receiver or utilize these qualifications. Now, the, quali the authority of the receiver is this, they contract for necessary labor and supplies for the rehabilitation or demolition. They can borrow money from approved lending institutions or government program using the receiver's lien as security, manage the property and pay operational expenses, including taxes, insurance, utilities, general maintenance, and debt secured by an interest in the property, collect all rents and income from the property used to pay for current operating expenses and repayment of outstanding rehabilitation or demolition expenses, manage the property after rehab with all powers of a landlord for up to two years, foreclose on the receiver's lien or accept a deed in lieu of foreclosure. 
Now, in the scoring system of these properties, do understand that the receivership only pertains to vacant properties. Um, and the properties are going to score a much higher point um, for properties in which uh, have basically been abandoned. If there's no owners, there's heirs that want nothing to do with the property, uh, no one's been in contact in the case, those properties are going to score a much higher point and are going to be ranked higher in the receivership, uh, in the receivership system. Uh, so you're kind of looking at what I think is going to happen is you're kind of looking at properties that's going to score uh, that are blighted to the community, uh, that are troubled properties that we're constantly boarding up um, or a crime is constantly occurring at that um, um, needs to either be demolished or needs to be rehabilitated. I think those are the properties that you're going to see that, that rises to the forefront. Um, but we've not scored any of them yet. Uh, we're still waiting for some uh, other administrative items from staff to be completed uh, before we start that scoring to see where they rank so we can see what the top 20 properties are going to be. So you're not looking at properties that are in really good condition that only needs a few things where, we, where you have a more responsive owner that's trying to gain compliance you're not looking at those properties. Those properties will not score high enough. Um, frequently asked questions, uh, these in, in your, um, which will be on the website, these have been uh, put out. What's a receiver? Uh, when does a receiver get appointed? Um, I believe we've covered a lot of these in the presentation so far, but I can provide you with a, um, uh, with the frequently asked questions when I send you a copy of the PowerPoint. Rehabilitation program eligibility and process. It's Cindy, let me see here. It's Son Cindy or Sonia. I see James, I see Russ, I don't see Melissa. Okay. All right, so I'll briefly go over these program. So we have the homeowner housing rehabilitation program. This works to help low and moderate income homeowners fix their home. It will take care of all major housing code and structural problems and making your home safe and comfortable for many years. Loans are offered in this particular program. You also have the rental housing improvement program in which it offers low interest deferred loans to rehabilitate rental property, seven units or less. The program provides repairs for purchase or rehab project assistance for 25% of the total redevelopment cost and rehab project assistance for 50% of the rehab cost. You have the code repair program which the city offers this program to help low income owners complete repairs under code enforcement. Owners must have completed a portion of repairs and the program will, pay, will loan up to $15,000 to complete the necessary repairs. You have the urgent repair program. Uh, this is an emergency repair, lead hazard control and rehab program. Um, lead hazard control partners work to identify and control lead hazards in eligible housing through inspection, risk assessments, contracts for specialized cleaning, lead remediation and abatement, and clearance testing. Our contractors, the uh, Neighborhood Development Department has an ongoing need for participation by local qualified contractors in the department's housing rehabilitation program. The goal is to improve nearly 20 or more units uh, each year uh, using community development block grant, home funds, and other funds. So qualifications of participating in rehab programs is that you must live, you must be within the city limits. You must have flood insurance if you're in a flood zone. Townhomes and condos are not eligible. All 
owners have to sign all contracts, loan documents, and application. Only permanent housing structures are eligible. The process, and this process is currently being um, uh, reviewed and modified. Uh, Sonia Randolph is our, is our new housing rehabilitation uh, administrator. Uh, the application with all supporting materials, title searches from legal, loan closing, and then construction. It is under eligibility, it is not a grant for rehab. A loan is provided for the amount of the equity in a property up to $60,000. Loan, loan is determined by the income, less than 50% deferred, greater than 50% repayment of a loan. A deferred loan until, it's a deferred loan until no uh, longer owner occupied with 0% interest. Repayment loan, the course of 20 years with 3% interest. Title search and credit check, no more than one lien on a property. Judgments counts as a lien and current on their taxes. They can be combined with up to $20,000 in lead and $15,000 in handicapped or ADA compliant. Emergency repair loans is up to 15,000, cannot be combined with, a re with rehab. Uh, they can be combined with lead and handicap. No credit check, income intake, title search requirements are the same. All right, now this is for Jasmine. I'm here. Sorry, I was trying to look up the city official to find, but I, I, I can look it up later and um, provide an email to the commission. Um, so just want to give you some quasi-judicial basics. Um, all residents have a constitutional right to an impartial decision maker. Um, and that basically means for the commission, no minimum housing uh, commission member may participate in or vote on a case in a manner that would violate uh, the affected person's constitutional rights to an impartial decision maker. And some of the impermissible violations of due process include a member having a fixed opinion prior to the hearing um, that is not susceptible to change, uh, undisclosed ex parte communications, a close familial business or other associational relationship with an affected person or a financial interest in the outcome of the matter. Um, and I just want to briefly mention the code of conduct. The city council adopted the revised boards and commissions handbook last April, well, April 2019. And basically uh, some of the points from it include the minimum housing commission shall maintain an atmosphere free of discrimination, bias and bullying. And all minimum housing commission members shall sign the code of conduct agreement. That form was sent out um with the agenda so it's in the last email you received from troy if if you all could if all the commissioners could just sign and date it and give it back to them as soon as possible that would be much appreciated um as you all know the city values honesty respect integrity stewardship fairness equity accountability and independence from undue influence and we encourage open constructive feedback to improve programs, effective communication and listening. We ask that you just treat staff, stakeholders and the public with respect. And so basically I'll talk about a little bit about the appeal process. It's not something that we worry about too often. Um, we don't get very many appeals. This year we had one appeal um, in January, which was withdrawn after this discovery phase. We keep records of everything and we provided them with all the information we had regarding the case and they withdrew the appeal. Um, but an appeal of a notice of violation or other enforcement order stays enforcement of the action 
And this includes the accumulation of fines during the pendency of the appeal. Uh, okay. So basically when a, a decision is appealed, it goes to superior court. Uh, the court shall allow the record to be supplemented with affidavits, witness testimony, or documents. If the, that's fine, you can go ahead. Show your screen. Yeah, that wasn't me. Oh, okay. Okay. Can you, can you go to the, I think up two slides? Um, the court shall ensure that the commission's findings, inferences, conclusions, and decisions were not in excess of statutory or ordinance authority, including preemption, which preemption just means that you're not allowed to act. Um, inconsistent with applicable statutory or ordinance procedures, affected by other error of law, unsupported by competent material and substantial evidence in view of the entire record, arbitrary or capricious. If the court concludes that an enforcement action was not supported by substantial competent evidence or was otherwise based on an error of law, the court shall reverse the decision. Um, civil actions for declaratory relief. A person with standing may bring an original civil action seeking declaratory relief, injunctive relief, damages or other remedies in superior court or federal court to challenge the enforceability, validity or effect of a local regulation. Uh, they can, they, some of the claims include unconstitutionality, um, preemption, taking a property, Uh, a person must first bring the claim to the board. If an adver if the board makes a if the commission makes an adverse ruling, then the court may hear the case de novo. Uh, the person has one year after written notice of the final decision delivered by personal delivery, email, or first class mail. The action may be joined with the petition for writ of certiorari. If the court finds that the city violated a statute or case law setting forth unambiguous limits on its authority, the court shall award reasonable attorney's fees and costs to a person who successfully challenged the city's action. Unambiguous means that the limits of authority are not reasonably susceptible to multiple constructions. Again, we, we don't we don't see these issues uh, very often, but I'm just reminding everyone of the laws related to the commission. Um, you can go to the next slide. That's the last one. Oh, okay. Question. All right, so I tried to call Ms. Waddell back. I don't know if she's in here. She was on my speaker for my cell phone. Uh, is she still on? Yeah, I see her there. Can you hear me, Ms. Waddell? All right, hold on, here she is. Can you hear me? You can hear me now? Yeah. All right, I got you back on speaker for the commission. All right, so are there any questions? I know earlier uh, we've had a lot of discussion on receivership and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this uh, discussion information and sit down with uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, Stanley Wilson, and uh, and I'll share this feedback um, and uh, I'll check with double check with MWBE to see what uh, uh, authorities we have as far as our business practices uh, for the RFP and RFQ process um, and see what uh, see what can be done um, or if any if any changes and we'll make the adjustments as necessary. Um, in the process, as I said earlier, it is a pilot, uh, so we want to see uh, we want to see if it even works. We want to see if the contractors uh, even want to come forward and put their money into a property that's uh, that can become a lien. Um, so we'll we'll be monitoring. I will um, look to see what how we're going to do our SWOT analysis, either a, a um, how our analysis is going to look like. 
so that I can tell you what go, what um, actions we're going to measure. Uh, and that would, I think that will help um, uh, Commissioner Young's question earlier on the measurement of the pilot. So I'll go back and look at the program uh, information that was submitted to council and, and uh, see if I can uh, research what that information is. Going oh, wait, excuse me, you're breaking up again. So I'll, I'll go back and look at that program to see what uh, that matrix analysis is going to look like. Hi, um, I have one. Oh, go ahead. That was it. Oh, no, I was going to ask you, you said that you had six entities that had, that specifically um, indicated an interest in, in becoming receivers? Just six people that called after the news story ran in the newspaper. They're like, hey, you know, what is this? Tell us more about it. Um, we shared briefly what the program was about. They said, okay, you know, will you put a, you know, keep our information and let us know when the RFQ is released. Uh, and that is not uncommon. When people, people will call like the last six months before we advertise for the nuisance abatement process, mm -hmm. they said, hey, we want to start mowing for the city again. Can you let us know when y'all start, you know, when y'all open um, for contracts? So we keep a we we keep a list, and then we we definitely send it to them. We have to solicit to everyone that MWB sends us to solicit to. Plus, if we want to expand our um, um, uh, base of information to get contractors, then we would also include our partners with the Greensboro Business League, um, as well as any other contract groups. The uh, uh, landlord, Greensboro Landlord Association, anywhere to get information out there because you want to create a large pool um, of, uh, of information and, and eligible persons that can rehab the structure because in the end, the, um, you have blighted, dilapidated, unsafe structures that sitting in communities where the neighborhood meetings that we've attended, um, you know, they, they, they'll tell us they're hurting. They want these structures um, remedy. Um, people need a safer and affordable place to live and that's what we want to, to put back into the housing stock and one of the things that uh, it's not in this pilot but it's, it's certainly something that we can look at and when we see how the pilot goes is if we see a change or if we see a disparity that uh, Commissioner Brown and uh, Chairman Asikoff and, and Commissioner Young has brought out here if we see something like that happening in just the 20 pilot cases, then there's a change that we can make. One of those changes can be that if we want to change the, the, the outcome of a property, then we might can take some funding from one of our programs and attach our funding to it in order to help the contractor. But when we attach funding to it, we get the opportunity to set conditions. And in the opportunity of setting those conditions may be that they must make the structure affordable housing, that they must uh, rent it, sell it, um, or return it to any person in a, uh, a certain income bracket uh, or a certain percentage of the poverty level, which is where you get affordable housing uh, and section eight qualifications. There's conditions that can be attached if we attach funding. Um, so, but those are all those are all options. What what that looks like, I don't know. Uh, that's why this is a pilot for us to explore it to see whether or not this is a program that is worth the city's investment uh, and see if it can be successful. So we're going to be monitoring and, and measuring it as we go. Hey Troy, I know you said earlier that, you know, you've got individuals calling saying, hey, you know, we want you to fix up this structure. You know, the next time somebody calls you, you should tell them like, hey, why don't you go ahead on and put some money down and we'll work with you to help get this thing going and let's see how many people call you back. It's easy yeah. to make it, you ain't paying for it. It's another thing when you ain't got any money and you're trying to fix it. And there's two different sides of that coin. You got one coin where people want to see something a certain way and there's another coin where you got to pay for it. And just like in our business, Oftentimes people, tenants, ten, tenants and plumbing want everything until they find out they got to pay for it. Then they're like, I ain't about to do that, but uh, it'll be just fine the way it is. So I only say that to say, 
that I am 100% for making sure the city looks good and looks great, but I don't want to do it. Or I don't, I don't want to be a part of anything that's going to take something from somebody because they're down on their luck or because they're poor. It's easy to beat up on poor people. The court's been doing it forever. So we need to, we need to level that playing field 100%. And this receivership program, pilot, whatever you want to call it, you're going to see exactly, I can already tell you, but I, I don't see why we need to have a pilot to do something that we already know is going to happen. But if that's what the city wants to do, so be it. But all you're going to do is create a lot of bad blood when people start losing their properties. And that's what's going to happen. I don't even want 20 people to lose their houses over individuals who can who have the ability and finance to be able to pretty much take from it. And like I said, per our conversation earlier, now they don't have to go to the owner. They can just go to the courts and then they can own it. They're, by, they're sidestepping the people who want to sell it for whatever they think it's worth and being able to just say, well, the court said I could do this, so you got to do that. And that's that I honestly believe I can't believe the courts are actually even going to even entertain that. But, but I think uh, I think Jasmine may can speak to the courts because I'm not a I'm not a court official. Um, but I think the uh, the courts use extreme discretionary um, um, decision when they're looking at properties. And of course, when they're looking at takings, um, because they they can't just take a property from somebody. Uh, and, and move it to another person without some sort of statutory authority. And the receivership does not do that. Uh, the receivership only appoints a person to rehab it, fix it, comply with the statute, and then it gives the, the judge decides to give the property back to the owner, but the owner of the property- Sorry, you're breaking up. But, but, but like yeah. you said previously, it would create a lien on the property. They don't act outright have to give up the property. Right. You're right. The judge is not going to say it's your house now. What they're going to say is you owe him this money and the person just can't afford it. It's kind of what the banks did back uh, back when they were making these poor loans that they knew were actually known as predatory. The Obama administration and the attorney general at the time, Eric Holder, launched an investigation and found that the majority of major banks had made poor loans that they knew the individual could not afford. And so basically they, they were crooked. And I want to make sure that our commission doesn't turn out to be crooked and that the courts don't turn out to be crooked. Because that's really what happened. The banks knew these people couldn't afford it. And slowly but surely, a lot of them were minorities. They started losing their houses because they couldn't deal. They couldn't own it. They couldn't make the payments. And, the, and they knew that. And the banks knew that. So that's something that, you know, we got to take a look at. And that's why we're here. Okay. All right. So thank you. Thank you all for your feedback. Um, and for participating in the annual training. Are there any final questions? Yeah, uh, Troy, can I just uh, throw in uh, a minute, please? Yes. Um, I uh, just want to register a general concern that uh, when uh, folks who have interpreters show up before us, that we are following some sort of procedure that gives uh, the interpreter, whether it's a family member or a professional, the opportunity to fully translate or from, sorry, to hold fully on, interpret just, what's going on. Commissioner Young, hold on just a second, if I may, legal counsel got cut off and I, apparently I had to put Ms. Waddell on hold so I can answer her phone. All right, you okay. said you got cut off. All right. Let me see if I can let me see if I can merge your call at the same time with Ms. Waddell and then both of you'll be on speaker. Hold on. All right, Ms. Waddell, can you hear me? All right, Ms. Uh, Ms. Presser. code and my, my computer's crashing. I need to restart it. So I'm on speakerphone now. I'm not in the Zoom call. All right. So y'all can hear, her, hear them. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Commissioner Young. Sorry about that. Yeah. So I'll just repeat very quickly. Um, my general concern is that when uh, residents are coming before us with the use of a, an interpreter, that we follow some sort of consistent um, process that allows the interpreter to do his job, whether it's a family member or especially if it's a paid professional. Um, 
my observation has been that we don't always do that. And as far as I know, the uh, resident who's appearing before us is entitled to hear every single thing that's going on in their native language. Um, regardless of whether this has any kind of like legal, like things that could be complained about in some judicial hearing thing, I think it just, um, it's something that, that we all can be doing a whole lot better to make sure that people walk away uh, informed about what their options are. And, you know, in some cases, even happy about the way in which they were treated when they come before us. So I just want to throw that in again, uh, the importance of, of, of letting the interpreters do their work. And also us, I would say, check in to make sure that the resident fully understands all the stuff that's being said to them. Right. And I, and I certainly agree with you. One of the things that I've seen in the observations uh, with the use of an interpreter, and, and, and we're going to talk to the interpreters that, that are contracted, uh, that, we, that we have to pay, is that if everyone is talking too much, you know, meaning like too fast, one right after the other one, that we give the interpreter that time. To, to tell the, the, the owner verbatim what was said, because that's that's the services that we're paying the interpreter for. We want yeah, if I could just, if I, yeah. Um, just one more thing, since you said that the city's paying for, the, for some of the interpreters, uh, yeah. my observation is that some of the interpreters aren't doing their job. Like um, that interpreter has the, the initiative they have the power and this is what they're supposed to be doing as professional interpreters. That's their code of ethics to, to interrupt and to make sure that like, if, if, the, if the interpreter was to signal to anyone in the room, to, to the chairman, hey, could you slow down? Or hey, I need to have that repeated again or something like that. Um, it pains me to see interpreters who are being paid by the city who are not doing their job, who are saying stuff like, oh, the client gets it. As far as I'm concerned, um, they're not earning their money. That's as far as I know, in terms of their code of behavior and stuff, their ethics, they're, they're just collecting pay. They're not really doing their job. So I, I hope we can help hold them to a higher standard or if necessary, report back to their, their bosses, whether it's language resources or somebody else to say like, hey, they're not really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. Thank you for that. I do have that in there. We will uh, make sure that's a much better system. Um, and and that is one of the things uh, that when when we do have an interpreter and um, and we'll try to uh, make sure that the interpreter knows that they can ask um, for someone to give them a moment so that they can be sure that every single word uh, is, 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 uh, is interpreted uh, for you all as well as to the homeowner uh, because they need to hear every word uh, and then they need to be able to communicate uh, you know their response so I agree with you Commissioner Young thank you does anybody else have any questions All right, seeing none, uh, that would conclude our training. I will send you the uh, PowerPoint um, information. And also, um, if you would, um, if you have the ability to print the code of conduct form and email that to myself or to Christy Holt, uh, we have to group them and get them to the city clerk um, as, soon as, as soon as we receive them. All right, thank y'all very much. And we'll see you at your next uh, regular meeting. Thank you, Troy. Mm -hmm.